Good morning. We're talking about arguments. How many here have never been in an argument? Is there anyone here who's willing to acknowledge you are good at arguing and you win most of them? <laughs> you know who you are. And, uh, so did Jesus ever argue? And the answer is yes. The question is, what did he argue about? Who did he argue with? But even more importantly, how did he argue? We started this series last Sunday, and we're continuing this series uh, this Sunday, and we're going to find out uh, what Jesus argued about related to rules. And so in Mark, the 12th chapter, beginning in verse 28, it said, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him. Now, the, the answer actually has to do with last Sunday's talk, in case you're interested about that. This is a question. Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one answered Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. You missed it, didn't you? It was a mic drop moment. And when Jesus responded the way he did, if he had a mic, he would have dropped it and everyone would go, no more questions. What was it that was so stunning in his response that caught everyone in the room off guard? And, and they decided, this is not the guy you want to question or argue. And what we're going to do today is we're going to unpack that. And what you'll find out is there's a reason why we're a little bit tone deaf to this conversation. It has a lot to do with the way we're raised in our culture and, and some of our experiences in life. But uh, th there'll come a moment in this message when uh, you will have the same kind of experience that those people did. And what I want you to do is to hang on because um, that could be a little bit uncomfortable in that moment. Just, it will get better, I promise. So the conversation begins with a very well thought out question. And the question is, what's the greatest commandment? What's the most important? What's the most important rule to follow? And here's what you need to know about rules. The first is rules save lives. When you get on a throughway and the speed limit is limited, that's to save lives. When you see stop signs, the reason is, is to save lives. Uh, we, we are told all kinds of rules and, and codes, and the goal is always to save lives. Now, here's what's also true about rules. Rules limit life. The very rule that keeps you safe on the road will make you late for work. Is it not true? The very rule that requires you to pay your taxes will limit the kind of vacation you can take this year. Right? So rules help preserve and protect life. They save life, but rules also limit life. And so the guy comes to Jesus and he has this, this question, what's the most important rule? And, and that indicates that rules are on a sliding scale, right? They don't have all equal value and importance. Even our own legal system recognizes this. If you jaywalk and are given a ticket, how many are glad that that is not equal to the death penalty? <laughs> right? No, I saw you, you crossed in the middle, and it wasn't at a crosswalk, and so that's it, you're done. They, they don't do that, all right? A fine, a fine. But if you take life, then you could wind up with life imprisonment or, in some states, even death penalty. So there's a sliding scale. The guy comes to Jesus. Does God have a similar sliding scale, or does he keep all the rules exactly the same? And here's the hidden question. It's easy for us to miss it. The hidden question is, when you ask, what's the most important rule, 
The other question is, so what are the ones that don't matter that much that I can ignore? <laughs> Which one of those can I kind of leave off? And uh, when, when you have the whole conversation about rules, there are some people who just think, well, there shouldn't be any rules. You can't live like that. By the way, that is a rule. It's only one, granted, but the, the one rule, no rules. That is a rule. So already they've lost their battle, but the complete chaos that would just erupt as a result of that would, would just destroy life at levels we can't possibly imagine. And so the, the more reasonable question is, who has a right to make the rules, and why am I obligated to follow them? That is a really good question. And that's the question that people argue about all the time, right? Our culture is divided in a great divide and a great debate over which rules matter, who had the right to write them, and which rules should be written because certain things are not being done. This is, this is how our culture fights through this. And there are some people who just say, well, I want to be the one who decides for myself what the rules are. And here's the challenge. The moment we start deciding for ourselves, we will tend to pick rules that favor us at others' expenses. As well motivated as you are, the simple truth is that will happen. So who has the right to make the rules? Well, the primary, this is really fascinating. Why do people break rules? And there are reasons people break rules. And the primary uh, reasons for breaking rules, the first is fear. Why do you break a rule? Because you're afraid. You're afraid you won't get what you want if you play by the rules. You're afraid that someone else is going to control your life. You're just afraid. You're afraid that, that life will be limited in some way if you play by, I won't get the job I want, I won't get the relationship I want. So people just, they break rules in order to, because they're afraid they're going to miss out on something or someone else is going to control them and take advantage of them. There's a second motivation, and that's pride. And pride says, no one is going to tell me how to live my life. No one is going to run my life. I will be the judge. I am the person who gets to decide all of those things. And so the reason that people break the rules, so you say, well, well the rule says you can't do that. And uh, that, that doesn't work so good. Um, my wife and I, for our 25th anniversary, went to Italy. We'd saved for five years. It was a great trip. And if you've never been to Italy, not only are they stunning sights to see and unbelievably delicious food, there are phenomenal automobiles over there. And they drive on the road in ways that Americans are not capable of driving. And, uh, <laughs> and so we came back home, and it was on a Sunday, and I had scheduled someone else to speak here. And so we decided to go visit two of my pastor friends at their churches that day, one for the early service and one for the second service. And so as we're driving, my wife looks at me and said, why don't you drive like we're in Italy? We had the road to ourselves. There was nobody. I just drive like you're in Italy. Now, I had a Prius. And, and if you don't know what a Prius is, it's a hybrid engine. And what I tell everybody is that car made me more spiritual because I would step on the gas. And between the time I stepped on the gas and the time that anything happened, I had the opportunity for meditation, reflection, and contemplation. <laughs> it's just, so to drive like I was in Italy actually took a fair amount of time to work up that kind of velocity, but I did it. And that's when I noticed the spinning lights behind me. <laughs> and I just looked at my wife and I said, we should have stayed home today. <laughs> and so the police officer came over. And, and you know, I wasn't going to tell him. When, when he said, he asked, do you realize how fast you were going? I said, well, I, I, know, I know it was faster than it should be. And when he asked why, I didn't say because I wanted to drive like I was in Italy, because I'm not in Italy, <laughs> in Rochester. And out of the grace of God and his good heartedness, he let me off with a warning and he said, just be careful. And then he went down the road and hid. Thankfully, my Prius hadn't the time to work up the velocity necessary to get caught again. There, there are rules and we break them out of fear and out of pride. I should get to decide, but here's the surprise to us is what are the two primary motives for uh, rule keeping? And the answer is 
fear. If I break the rule, I will be punished. If I break the rule, people will think less of me. If I break the rule, I will disappoint someone. If I break the rule, bad things will happen. Fear is a very powerful motivator in rule keeping. And there's another motivator. You probably already guessed it, pride. If I keep the rules, people will think I am good or I am better. If I keep the rules, I will feel stronger than people who are not good at rule keeping. If I keep the rules, I can look down on others who are not good at this. And all of this is going on in the context of the question that the man asked, and it's going on in the context of our own lives. And here's what I want you to know. Some of us in this room are good rule keepers. We were just kind of raised that way. It's built in. We, we are compliant. And then others of us are good at rule breaking. And we like to identify ourselves as independent spirits, not restrained or confined by those preconceived, outdated notions of previous generations who don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> and so this is what happens, right? Either out of fear or out of pride. We break the rules, and out of fear, out of pride, we keep the rules. And so Jesus responds, what's the greatest commandment? And his response is, God is one, and you love him with everything you've got, and you love people like you love yourself. And he reframes the question in a way that, that is surprising. We, we're too familiar with the passage. We've heard it too many times. We don't notice what Jesus is, is tearing up and showing that crowd that day. And the first thing he wants us to see is this, is that the law is actually an expression of love. The reason that the law is given is because God loves us and he wants us to love him and love others. And so when a person lives out of love, this, this is the way they live. This is how loving people treat each other. So breaking the law is actually the absence of love. Breaking the law is the absence of love. The purpose of the law is to expose unloving behavior. That's what it does. When someone steals or someone lies or someone kills, that's not loving. The law reveals it. So it says, do not lie. Everyone here has been lied to. Everyone here knows what it's like to feel violated when somebody lies to you. Someone told us something that was not true, either because they were afraid of a consequence or they, they wanted to own something or, or, or they thought more of themselves than they should. So they told us something and we believed them. And that left a remarkable impact in our life. Makes it hard to trust them, makes it hard to trust others. Just because of a lie. So God also knew that with lying, it's not just a personal thing. It has huge implications in terms of justice issues. If a person goes in and gives a testimony that is not truthful, it can subvert justice. It can keep people from getting what is due them. It can allow things to go on that should have been stopped just because someone who stood on a witness stand and put their hand in the air and promised they were telling the truth did not do so. Consequences are unbelievable. To lie is an unloving way to act towards God or towards others. Or, or how about, do not steal. To take something from someone else that they did not give you and you did not pay for. What are we really saying? I want that more than I want you. I value that more than I value you. I will take that. And there's all kinds of ways that we can steal. It's not just breaking into someone's house or sneaking into someone's car. There's all kinds of ways. We, we can steal time from our employer. We can, we can steal from the government in our taxes. We, there's all kinds of ways that we can steal. And on the employer's side, we can, we can not correctly compensate people for the work they've done, find lots of reasons not to do it. And all of that is a form of theft. And why do people do that? Because they're afraid that they're not going to have something that they want, or they're proud and they think that they deserve it. Every single law of God is given to help us identify unloving behavior. And the reason that God is able to give that law is because no one understands love better than God does. Now, I know sometimes people say, well, I'm more loving than God. First of all, that proves you've done very little research about God. 
Because God did something for us that none of us would do for each other. You know, well, he gave his life. No, he gave his son's life. And I'll tell you what, you might be willing to lay down your life for someone else, but just think about it if it's your child. We have no idea what that costs God. Really big deal. We think we know more about love than God does, but when we follow through on our limited understanding and our experience of love, we always wind up hurting someone else. So according to Jesus, what he's revealing in his response is sin is not just breaking the rules. Sin is not loving. That's the issue. That rule breaking just identifies where and when and with whom sin occurred. That's what it does. Sin is acting in an unloving way towards God or towards others. So Jesus also reveals that truth-keeping can be done for unloving reasons. For example, all right, let's suppose that you are required to tell the truth. By the way, there's, there's one question that, that no husband should ever respond to. Does this dress make me look fat? <laughs> Just don't go there, all right? Plead the fifth. Stay out of it. Right? But sometimes we tell the truth because we are afraid of disappointing someone or we're afraid of being caught. Or sometimes we tell the truth because we actually want to take someone down a notch or two. And I'm going to use this harsh and harshly delivered truth to put that person in their place. See? Fear, pride, just keeps showing itself up. So do you see what Jesus is doing? He's telling us that the motivations for breaking the rules are the exact same motivations for keeping the rules. Fear and pride are never a form of love. Law keepers and law breakers are in the exact same boat. And that's an uncomfortable thing, thought to think. So no one was ready for Jesus' response. And by the way, we're not either. And we begin to wonder, here's the question. You ready? Here's the question. Then why bother keeping the rules? All right. This is the uncomfortable moment. This is when the light comes on. You ready? If you think that thought, it's because your reason for keeping the rules is something other than love. Why bother keeping the rules? If we're all in the same boat, what difference does it make? And that thought proves that something other than love is motivating your behavior. So Jesus reveals that the way out of sin is through repentance. Now, a lot of us confuse repentance with regret. And regret is feeling really bad about something that you've done. And here's what I want you to know. I have known a number of people in my life who have felt absolutely horrible about something that they have done. And yet nothing ever changed in their life. In fact, some of the greatest regret I have seen from people is on repetitive cycled behavior where they just keep doing the same thing over and over again. They feel powerless in it. They don't understand it. And the amount of regret is unbelievable. Jesus does not say that the way you break the sin cycle and escape this gravitational pull where whether we're keeping the rules or breaking the rules is all based on the same thing. He doesn't say it's because you feel super bad about it. You might, but that's not what gets you free. What gets you free is that you see yourself differently and you see God differently and you make a different kind of decision. So you see yourself differently. How, how can we see ourselves differently? What we recognize is, is that since I'm motivated by the same things, I am capable of doing the same things as anyone else. And our culture does not like that. We actually believe that lesser people do worse things. And I would never do something like that. You have already crossed the most important bridge to doing the worst thing. And that is to assume that you are better than someone else. Because lesser people do not deserve equal responses. And so there we are. Now you know why people didn't want to ask Jesus any more questions. <laughs> Uncomfortable. 
It starts with the and our culture doesn't like to be told. You are capable of doing anything that has ever been done by any person because we are all, we are all susceptible to the same motives. And it doesn't matter whether we're rule keeping or rule breaking. We will do unexplicable things. We are capable of incredible atrocities just given the right situation, the right opportunities, the right pressures. Our fear will drive us to do the most unbelievable things. And our pride will drive us to do the most unbelievable things. And so it feels like a trap. How can I ever get out of this? And Jesus says it starts with repentance. You see yourself as being capable of doing anything. That's where it starts. And then you see your heavenly father as one whose his only motive towards you is love. He's not afraid and he's not proud. He just loves us. So the t when the teacher responds to Jesus to love God with everything and love each other as yourself, that, he, this is what he says. It's even more important than the sacrifices. But he actually means more than what we hear. What, what he actually means is the righteousness that flows from a loving response exceed the righteousness that flows from a sacrificial response. Because as well-intended as we may try to be, and as compliant as we may try to be, and as good at rule-keeping as we may try to be, none of us are 100% all the time. Like maybe you know somebody, they only get it right 10% of the time. They're just a hot mess. But even the, what's the opposite of a hot mess? A cold mess, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> the, the person who seems like they, they do better than most still fail. At what percentage? Doesn't matter. So there's this whole sacrificial system built into the equation that, that when it was revealed, you acted in an unloving way. You could go back to God, and by putting a lamb on the altar, you could get reconnected with him. And that was the method, except now it, people can corrupt any system, right? So I'm going to steal from you, so I'll get my lamb ready to go. Just throw another lamb on the altar, and nothing's changing. And it dawns on this guy, man, if you live out of love, that righteousness exceeds, it exceeds any other righteousness that exists. And Jesus looked at him and he says, you are not far from the kingdom because that righteousness flows out of love. You see, Jesus endured a cross and all the shame that went with it. And this is the guy who is the first and only human to always act in loving ways on every occasion. He always acted in loving ways. He always told the truth for the right reasons. He never took anything that did not belong to him. He never treated people differently in order to elevate his status or try to hang around more important people so he was more important or ignore less important people so he didn't get tagged by being one of them. He always acted in a loving way. And the consequence for this loving behavior was a cross. He was crucified by humans. And even his own loving heavenly father turned his back on him. From the cross, we hear Jesus say, why have you forsaken me? So why would Jesus do this? Why would he live the perfect loving life and then endure a cross? Was it because he was afraid of disappointing his father or afraid that something bad would happen? No, there is no fear in him. Was it because he was proud and he just wanted to prove that he could endure more than other people? No. If you want to know why Jesus stayed on that cross to endure its full force and effect, it was because he loved you. It was not nails that held him to that tree. It was his love that kept him there. And his response when all of this is coming against him, the people he loved and, the, and his heavenly father that he loved, they're, they're crucifying him and rejecting him. What is his response? It's forgiveness. Why? Because love is what motivates him. This is what I want you to see. When you come to Jesus, you realize that you're motivated by the exact same things that motivate people that you despise. But when you come to Jesus, there's actually nothing to fear. 
Because Jesus already took on him all the punishment for all the sin that you have ever committed. And God is a just God, and he will never require two payments for the same sin. God will never do that. And there's no reason to be proud because we recognize I can't live the perfect loving life. There's lots of motives that are hidden and lots of agendas that I care not to reveal. And so, but he is the one who did it. You see, this is what I want you to see. Jesus is the only option that drives out fear and kills pride. The only one. Because the only motive that God has is love. And the only response that God is asking for is love. And here's the amazing thing. The more you respond to God in love, what you discover is you're capable of being more loving. And now you're not trying to keep rules or break rules because you're afraid or because you're proud. You just love God and you love others. We live out the law not because we're afraid, not because we're proud. We're growing in love. And there it is. The whole system of rule keeping and rule breaking collapsed in a single conversation with Jesus. And now you know why no one wanted to ask him any more questions. Let's bow our heads this morning. Um, maybe this morning has been just a little bit challenging for you and quite honestly then I, I think that is time well spent. Maybe in the review of your life, it, you're realizing, you know what? Some of the things I do that look good, it can be fear. It can be pride. And some of the reasons I break rules it can be fear and it can be pride. And what I want you to know is that's the first step in repentance. That It's the same thing that drives all of us. We're not better than anyone. And that recognition about yourself is life changing. And then to recognize that God's only motive towards you is love. Once you recognize those two things, there's only one thing left to do. And that's just give God permission to engage your life in a way and to connect with you in a way that transforms your heart. So that not only do you get to spend more time with him, but you get to treat other people the way he wants them to be treated. So at some point today, if this is something you have not done, I'm not asking you how long you've been around church environments or how good you are at rule keeping, the, the likelihood that the, there's a, a fair number of compliant rule keeping people in this room is pretty high. What I'm asking is do you recognize that it's not our rule keeping or rule breaking that has any impact on our relationship with God. It's his love for us and our love for him. And if you're coming to that realization today, before the sun sets today, I would strongly encourage you to have a conversation with God. Just tell him you're not different than anyone else. Tell him that you've come to realize that he's actually motivated by love and then give him permission to lead and guide your life. It changes everything. Father, help us today. Help us recognize your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.